Good evening, everybody. Um, I'd like to call the meeting to order and formally open the 2024 annual town meeting. I've determined that a quorum is present, and I've examined the warrant and find it in order. At this point, if we could rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under Seven o'clock. That was the warrant, so yeah, I appreciate it. Um, as you've seen from the warrant, there's a decent sized agenda, so we do want to keep a pretty good pace going, but we do want to make sure everyone has the time to uh, speak and listen. So uh, I don't want to sound too, too wonky, but I just want to thank everyone who's here tonight. Uh, in a town of thousands of people, the people that are here this evening will decide the budget, the schools, and much of the direction that the town will take over the next year. So uh, decisions aren't made on social media, they're not made at the, the dump on Saturday or the transfer station, but uh, they're made here by the people who show up and vote. So I thank you for, for coming and, and making the time. Uh, just to understand the process for those of you that may be new to it or just need a refresher, the select board uh, establishes the, the warrant, the, the articles that you'll hear this evening, um, and select the order that those will be heard in. And from there, several committees meet, they discuss the articles, they meet with the select board, uh, make recommendations, those articles are fine-tuned, and then what is before you tonight is, is what comes. So I, I want to thank the select board and the committees for, for their time leading up to tonight. Um, at check-in, everyone should have received the town meeting packet, and I just wanted to take two seconds to kind of go through that. Town meeting in Massachusetts uh, is governed by uh, our bylaws and a publication that's called Town Meeting Time. It's a little book that many town meetings use in the state. So it's my job to make sure that we follow those rules. Um, I'm your town moderator. I have no role other than to make sure that the meeting runs smoothly and that we do follow those rules. So that's what I'll be referring to this evening. If there's at a point we are not understanding something or what's going on, feel free to raise your hand and come to the microphone and we can, we can clarify that. So. Um, Again, going through the guide, just to understand, you'll hear uh, things about the warrant and you'll hear things about m the motions. So the warrant is meant to give everyone public notice of what may come before the meeting this evening. But the motions, the, the motions that are made, are what you're actually voting on. So they may vary a little different from the warrant, but listening to the motions and understanding them is what, what ultimately uh, you'll be taking action on. In terms of what happens, a motion will be made, someone will second it, I'll turn to the person making the motion to ask them to briefly summarize uh, what the issue is, and then at that point open it up for questions. If you do have questions, um, the meeting not only is being uh, recorded, but also for audio purposes. You'll need to come to the microphone in each column um, and wait to be called on. When you are called on, just state your name. You don't need to state your number, but if you could state your street address, uh, and then proceed from there, that, that will be the process. If at any point uh, anyone needs the motion that's before you repeated, you can. Those amendments need to be in writing, so if there is a motion that is before you and you decide to amend it, you can come down to the front table uh, and we can help you write out that motion or amendment and uh, go from there. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce the head table. Again, my name is Dan Graves. I'm the town moderator, and to my right, Lisa Mead, Town Council. Casey Warren, Town Administrator. Cassie Sanderell, Town Clerk. Brenda Hill, Town Accountant. Trevor McDaniel, Select Board, Board of Health. Carolyn Ness, Select Board, Board of Health. Tim Hilchey, Select Board, Board of Health. Dave Sharp, Finance Committee, Personnel Committee. Julie Chalfont, Finance Committee. Beth Brown, Finance Committee. Mark Brennan, Finance Committee, Capital Improvements Planning Committee Chair. Margaret Nardowitz, Finance Committee. Jim Cambius, Finance Committee and Library Board. John Pereski, Finance Committee. All right, now uh, there's still a few people checking in, but we are gonna begin. So uh, I have two initial motions. 
I move that the reading of all articles be waived and that prior to the reading of a motion under the article, the moderator may briefly summarize the content of the article to be considered, and further that unless objection is raised, the reading of detailed motions be waived where the article as printed can, in the opinion of the moderator, be incorporated by reference in any motion presented. Second. This is just basically a, a process that allows us to essentially summarize some of the things that are before you without having to go into full detail. Again, if there's ever questions that the summary doesn't cover, feel free to stand up and we can go into more detail. But it's meant to move the meeting along. Any questions? All those in favor? Opposed? That motion carries. I move that the following people be allowed to address the audience during town meeting. Attorney Lisa Mead, Town Council. Brenda Hill, Town Accountant. Kate, Casey Warren, Town Administrator. Darius Modesto, Superintendent. Shelly Pareda, Director of Business Administration, Frontier Regional. Tina Jeme, Principal, Deerfield Elementary School. Richard Martin, Superintendent, Franklin County Tech School. Russ Cobris, Business Manager, Franklin County Tech School. Jessica Corwin, Jos Josie Silva, Araceli McCoy, Jimin Ahn, Joshua Sparks, South County EMS Chief. Second. Um, by your town bylaws, only people that are residents of Deerfield are allowed to speak at tonight's meeting. Often there are issues that come before the town that um, are not, that individuals who are not residents may have information to share. So this allows them to speak at the meeting. Any questions? I have one question. Yes. We, um, I didn't know if, um, if Cassie, our town clerk, needs to be on that list as well. We, yes. Okay. That was missed. I just thought we'd add it if we could. Absolutely. To make a motion to add um, Kathleen Cassie Sandorell, town clerk. Second. Second. We'll make that a friendly amendment. So all Thank those you. in favor of the motion as presented. Opposed. That motion carries. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. McDaniel. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Uh, for the, fl the past few years, we've been using a consent, a consent agenda, which allows us to move through some of the, what we'll call non-controversial articles, a little quicker. Um, so I'm going to ask Ms. Shores Ness to make a motion to state the letter before each um, item. And then if anyone would like to talk on the particular item, you just yell out, hold, and we'll come back to those. But otherwise, we'll do them all at once. So with that, Ms. Shores Ness, Article 1. I move the town approve Article 1 on the following matters, A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, as set forth in the warrant. Second. Ms. Shores Ness. Um, the town of Deerfield gratefully acknowledges the countless gifts and non-monetary gifts made by all the town. Um, nonprofit partners and and this article combines several of the annual requests into one article to expedite the business of the town meeting are there any questions all those in favor of the motion as presented opposed that motion carries excuse me just one moment okay Uh, Article 2, same process. This is a, a consent motion, so several items all at once. Mr. Hilchey? Um, on Article A, B, and C, I move the town transfer from free cash for the following items, A, B, and C, as set forth below, um, a reserve fund appropriation, an OPEB liability trust fund appropriation, and an out-of-district placement vocational education appro appro appropriation. Mr. Hilchey, briefly. So this year we um, reduced the reserve fund um, appropriation by $20,000 uh, to $100,000. Um, I might actually re request help from the Finance Committee to fully explain this reserve fund, but I will take up OPEB, which is um, <clears throat> other post-employment benefits that are required by the, 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 the town is required to um, set aside for uh, benefits that our employees are supposed to receive. We only fund this at about 4%, so it's a large liability that keeps building up year after year. And um, the vocational, the Smith Vocational Tech uh, School appropriation reflects the number of students 
that have opted to go there, and this covers their tuition and transportation costs to the school. Reserve fund, over to you, Julie. Finance committee, would you like to be heard? I would like them to explain. It doesn't work that way. Finance okay. committee, would you like to be heard? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Just reserve fund is um, money that is set aside that the finance committee has control over that can be used only for unforeseen and unextraordinary and extraordinary expenses that come up during the year. So if there's something very unexpected that happens, we have funds set aside that can be used to cover that. Um, finance committee would vote to do that. Um, and if it's not used, it rolls into free cash for next year. Thank you. Any questions? All those in favor of the motion as presented? Opposed? That motion carries. Article 3, Mr. McDaniel. I move the town appro uh, approve the maximum spending amounts for the revolving funds established in the Deerfield General Bylaws, Chapter 20, Section 20-3. Departmental uh, revolving funds pursuant to uh, general law chapter 44 section 53 e and a half as set forth in the warrant Second. Mr. McDaniel this is just an annual vote setting the maximum amount of uh, Spending limits for in these revolving funds for the recycling program the parks and recreation and planning Any questions All those in favor of the motion as presented Opposed? That motion carries as well. Article 4, Mr. Sharp. Thank you, uh, Mr. Moderator. Um, in my role as a member of the Personnel Committee, not the Finance Committee here, I'm uh, moving that the town amend Chapter 35, Personnel of the Deerfield General Bylaws, by deleting the entire chapter and substituting in its place the following language to become effective on July 1st, 2024, as presented in this handout. Second. Second. Mr. Sharp. Um, this article seeks, seeks to bring the town essentially uh, up to date uh, into legal compliance with state and federal requirements. Uh, the change is intended to allow the town to create a personnel administration system using a policy manual to stay compliant with state and federal laws as they change. Uh, it will also change the composition of the personnel board to include two select board appointees, one moderator appointee, one elected employee member, and maintain one finance committee member, and also maintain the town administrator or their designee as an ex officio non-voting member. Uh, it will maintain responsibility of the personnel board for wage review and classification of positions in town. It will clarify roles of the personnel board and select board in policy development and the process to change or add policies to a personnel uh, manual. Uh, through the addition of the elected voting employee member, the bylaw also seeks to create a more democratic process to give employees a, quote, seat at the table so they can participate, excuse me, in the development of policies that directly affect them. Is there anyone from the personnel board that would like to be heard? Any questions? All those in favor? Opposed? That motion carries. Article 5, Mr. Sharp. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. I move that the town adopt a classification compensation plan per the Deerfield General Bylaws, Chapter 35, Personnel, Article 3, Classification Compensation Plan for the fiscal year beginning July 1st, 2024, as presented in this handout. Second. Mr. Sharp. A um, couple things. The, uh, this is done annually, obviously, to set, uh, set pay and step raises and things like that. Uh, there was a person, personnel board recommended a change to the table in the warrant for two reasons. Uh, we identified a change to grade G, removing the EMS chief from the list, uh, and we also identify the positions currently classified under grade G, uh, but they're not included on the plan as they are contracted uh, positions under specific uh, general laws. Uh, removing these titles from the classification compensation plan 
uh, it's past practice of the town to consistently recognize these contracts as having different pay and benefit structures. Uh, these types of contracts exist to capture distinctive employment characteristics and to identify specific terms that allow towns to attract and retain qualified staff. Any questions? All those in favor of the motion as presented? Opposed? That motion carries as well. Article 6, Ms. George Ness. I move that the town transfer $30,000 from the vocational education appropriation to fund a fiscal year 2024 shortfall related to snow and ice removal expenses. Second. Ms. Shores Ness. This is money uh, that we appropriated in the current budget uh, for students that, to attend Smith Vocational School this past year, and actually less students um, uh, actually attended. So we have money in that count, and we would shift that over to the snow and ice uh, excess expenses that, we, that went beyond our appropriation this year. Any questions? All those in favor of the motion as presented. Opposed? That motion carries. Article 7, Mr. Hilchey. I move that the town transfer 1,726,000. Nope. Oh, I'm sorry, 1,726. <laughs> sorry, folks, didn't just waking you up out there. Um, <laughs> $1,726.84 from the Sewer Enterprise Fund retained earnings to pay FY 2023 bills for testing services at the old Deerfield Wastewater Treatment Facility. Vote to transfer $397.20 from South County Emergency Medical Services, also known as SCIMS, retained earnings to pay various individuals for overtime earned in FY 2023 and a portion of FY 2022 as required under the Fair Labor Standards Act, FLSA, and to vote to transfer $376.64 from free cash to pay an FY 2023 bill for publication costs. Mr. Hilgey? <clears throat> so there were $397.20, which represents the cost to pay previous employees at the South County EMS. Uh, we were not taking into account laws uh, that are covered in the fair labors, uh, <clears throat> the fair, yeah, the, the uh, anyway, they weren't being paid the correct rate for overtime when they were on shifts, Fair Labor Standards Act, there we are. Um, and so this is a very small amount of money and it covers employees to bring them back up to uh, the, the pay that they should have received for those overtime hours. Um, the town became aware in March 2024 that overtime was not calculated correctly. FLSA overtime calculations should include a shift differential for uh, in each week, work week. And once the error was found, the EMS chief and the treasurer worked diligently to correct the current payroll and make changes to the payroll sheets moving forward. Um, there's a two year look back period for these calculations. So the treasurer began the process to recalculate over time for FY 2023 and the period of March, June, 2022. Any questions? All those in favor of the motion as presented. All those opposed. That motion passes unanimously. Article 8, Ms. Shores Ness. I move that the town transfer from free cash the amount of $32,214 to a special fund established pursuant to Chapter 77 of the Acts of 2023, Section 9, for the purposes of using opioid settlement money received by the town in fiscal year 2023 for opioid use disorder, OUD treatment, support programs for people with OUD in treatment and recovery, connects to the care for people with or at risk of developing OUD, harm reduction efforts to prevent overdose deaths or other opioid-related harms. 
a support of the diversion and deflection program strategies for criminal justice involved persons with OUD, support of pregnant or parenting women and their families, including babies with neonatal um, abstinence syndrome, and to prevent misuse of opioids and implement prevention education. Good. This, sure this article will, seeks to transfer $32,214 in opioid settlement funds received in 2023, which rolled into free cash at the end of the fiscal years while the municipalities waited for the legislative um, legislature in conjunction with the Department of Revenue to change um, how the towns would hold the money. Until Chapter 77 of the Acts of 2023 were enacted, towns could only hold those funds in stabilization accounts. This change creates more flexibility and allows the town to spend the funds for purposes outlined in this article without prior appropriation through town meeting. Any questions or comments? All those in favor of the motion as presented. Opposed? That motion carries. Um, Article 9 is the budget. <clears throat> I was hoping we'd have everyone in and checked in by now, but uh, I think we're still, still waiting. Um, so at, at this point, um, Ms. Schwarzenegger, why don't you start the motion, if you would. I move the moderator read the amounts recommended to be appropriated under this article as referenced in the warrant. And unless objection is made, each item recommended in the report of the Finance Committee shall be tentatively accepted as appropriated for the purpose stated. If an objection is made to any recommendation, such appropriation shall be taken separately, and the amount thereof and the manner of the taking the same shall be determined by the vote of the meeting and tentatively accepted. One vote shall be taken appropriating each amount, so accepted as a single appropriation, not to be exceeded. Essentially, the, the motion, uh, the budget is presented in the handout, and there are pages, two or three pages, of line items for each budget. Um, and so what we've done in years past is I have read every single line item. If there's anything that you'd like to come back to, ask questions on, uh, or discuss further, if you can just yell out a clear hold, we'll continue to go through the whole list, and then at the end of me reading the whole list, we'll go back to the holds. So this kind of lets us go through everything and then come back to the ones that there is going to be some discussion on. Uh, and before we do any of that, the Finance Committee has uh, met and they've put together a presentation of eight minutes um, that they want to present to the town before we start that, that matter. So with that, the Finance Committee. Except I was told eight minutes was too long, so we're going to talk really fast um, <laughs> as soon as the slides come up. So this is a budget. This is an overview of the FY 2025 budget. It's an overview of what Finance Committee and Select Board and numerous other people have been talking about for the past five months. Um, ha, and there it is. Next slide. So the revenues that we have received that we will, are expected to receive next year as usual, the vast bulk of that will be the <laughs> property tax. Oh, there we go. Will be property taxes. So about 75% of our revenues are property taxes. The rest is made up of local receipts, um, funding from the state, free cash, and then a very small percentage is other. Um, if you look at the property tax line, you know that Prop 2.5 limits the increase to property taxes of 2.5% plus new growth plus excluded debt. In the bottom right-hand corner, you see the list of excluded debt that we have for FY25. It's Frontier Regional, the Highway Garage, and the Wastewater Treatment Plant. Um, if you picked up your handout, you can see that Frontier Regional expects to pay off their piece this coming fiscal year. So next year when we come back, that line will have dropped off, um, but I expect the library will be showing up at that point. Next slide. 
The expenses that we have, um, the omnibus budget is an increase of 4.6%. You can see that about two thirds of the way down the line. If you look at the other one I wanna point out, if you look at the next to last line there, you can see that our non-recurring expenses or the capital expenses we have are dropping fairly significant from last year to this year. Um, and we will talk about that more, but that's basically um, because we didn't have funding available to spend on capital. There were a number of capital requests that were submitted that were not approved for funding for, for this year because um, basically we don't have the funds available to do that. Next slide. Um, if you look at, this is sort of how our expenses um, lay out by category. Um, the education category is bigger than if you add up the numbers from the previous slide because we took the benefits that can be accrued to the, the people employed by the schools and included that in that category. So that brings education up to about 63% and the others fall out as you can see there. Next slide. Um, so the, the um, I don't know what to say about this. So the, these are the things that really changed in the omnibus budget. So across the board, we saw utilities, benefits, and insurance. They just went up. Those are things we don't have a lot of control over. Um, so those are increases that you see throughout. Baseline personnel costs increased 4.5%, as you just heard. It's a 2% cost of living adjustment was recommended by the personnel board. And then we have the 2.5% normal step increases. So pretty much everybody on the classification compensation plan has a 4.5% increase. We have quite a few employees who are under contract instead of on the class comp plan, but they see similar increases in their, um, uh, in their salaries. So there are also some, some specific changes. These are listed in decreasing order of dollar value impact, which is, I don't know, you gotta list them somehow. So that's how they're listed. Um, the first one is South County EMS. There's a new South County EMS director. He is putting some changes into place that should allow South County EMS to increase their revenues over the upcoming years. And we expect the amount that we spend um, on SCEMS, the, the subsidy that the towns have to provide on SCEMS to drop over the next few years, and we're quite hopeful that that happens. Um, second, we have turnover of two key positions in town uh, um, the upcoming year. Both of these folks expect to retire, so there is some funding in place to allow a smooth transition. Hopefully we'll be able to hire somebody new in and have a, you know, a bit of an overlap and be able to do it. Um, Brenda expects to retire at the end of next year, so we will get to see her at next town meeting. But very quickly, I want to give a shout out to Kevin Scarborough, who will no longer be the highway superintendent next year if he retires as he plans. <laughs> Kevin has given very, oh, do you guys have something you want to say? This is what we're thanking somebody, Brenda, as well. Yeah, yeah. We get to thank her next year because she'll still be here next anywhere. year. So. <laughs> but Kevin has given incredibly yes. dedicated um, service to the town over many, many years, and especially this past year with all the work that they did on the roads. So hooray for Kevin. Yes, thank you, Kevin. But, <laughs> So back to the budget stuff, um, third line down, we, uh, we as a town have made the decision over the past several years to hire some new people. There's a new planner. We've split the clerk and treasurer position. There's some new responsibility in the assistant town administrator role. We are seeing those positions kind of percolate out. There are adjustments in this budget, um, but increasing hours for some of these folks. Um, to get as we get the responsibilities ironed out. So that's an increase to the budget. Um, PFAS testing has been mandated. Um, that's a fairly significant expense for the landfill and the wastewater treatment plant both. Um, the senior center has increased the hours of their staff. Um, most of the salary for these folks are actually covered by grants, which is lovely. Um, their benefits are not, so the benefits you see increasing. And then also there's increased like uh, administration of the grants. So there's increased work by the folks in town hall to support the grants that are supporting the senior center. Um, 
There are increased inspections for food trucks. We're seeing a lot of food trucks at you know, Treehouse, at those schools. Um, that increases the health inspector work, um, but we also get fees for those inspections, so that's offset in the revenues line, so we see more incoming revenues to support that. Uh, we buy a police cruiser every year, and the cost of the police cruiser increase this year. And the last one is legal expenses. We pay a baseline retainer, and the price for that retainer has increased for next year. But we also pay separately for advice on labor issues, and we have several contracts that are up for renegotiated next year. So we expect that line item to increase as well. Next slide. All right, this is the last slide. Um, so first off is kind of the basic comment. We all went through every line item on this budget and everything falls within the legal constraints required. Um, we ...for the omnibus budget, which means that free cash is not available to pay for capital. So if you look at the second line there, we are, I already said, we're not doing a lot of capital expenses because we don't have the funding available. Last year, we spent a lot of reserves on that, so those reserves are no longer available. This year, we're spending a lot of free cash on our recurring expenses, so they're not available. So this is really not sustainable, um, and we need to be looking at this pretty um, focused on this over the upcoming year. Um, but we are excited about the SCIMS plan for improved revenue generation. And that's all I had, I think. Thank you. That was eight minutes, Julie. That was perfect. Thank you. Um, so with that, we're going to start on page 28 of the handout, and I will be uh, reading every single line. So uh, bear with me. Uh, moderator, $500. Select board salaries, $16,000. Again, if there's any item you want to come back to, you'll just yell out, hold. Um, select board staff salaries, $378,497. Select board administration expense, $19,000. Finance committee, $250. Accountant salary, $126,532. There's a hold. Um, accountant expense, $18,250. Assessor salaries, $11,000. Assessor's administrative expense, uh, I'm sorry, administrative assistant, $77,699. Assessor's expense, $19,110. Assessor's quinquennial recertification, $22,000. Treasurer collector salaries, $151,900. Treasurer collector expense, $36,250. Legal expense, $105,000. Personnel board, $500. IT hardware, $6,000. PG access capital expense, $4,000 with a hold. Contracted services, $268,334. Town clerk salaries, $109,527. Town clerk expense, $26,050. Conservation commission, $2,000. Open space committee, $250. Planning board, $2,000. Zoning Board of Appeals, $1,000. Agricultural Commission, $100. Energy Committee, $1,000. Town Office Building Maintenance, $106,800. Town Office Expense, $17,000. General Insurance, $78,000. Police Payroll, $1,127,865. It's a hold. Police Department Expense, $100,000. And eighteen thousand three hundred dollars. There's a hold. Police department cruiser sixty five thousand dollars. Inspections department payroll one hundred seventy eight thousand three hundred twenty four dollars. Inspections department expense four thousand nine hundred fifty dollars. Emergency management two thousand eight hundred dollars. Animal control twenty two thousand two hundred sixty six dollars. Deerfield Elementary School, $5,341,279. Frontier Regional School, $4,377,770. Frontier Regional Debt Service, $19,360. Frontier Regional Transportation, $94,894. Franklin Tech Assessment, $660,007. Franklin Tech Debt Service, $18,183. Mm -hmm. 
general highway pay payroll, $645,739. General highway expense, $327,000. Winter snow and ice removal, $95,000. Street lighting, $15,000. Transfer station expense, $249,300. Test well monitoring maintenance, $61,000. Board of Health payroll, $101,769. Board of Health expense, 11575 uh, Emergency COVID expense, $0. Council on Aging, $250. Senior Center expense, $90,299. Veterans District Assessment, $15,505. Veterans Benefits, $22,000. ADA Coordinator, $250. Tilton Library, $215,391. Summer swim program, $6,310. Tri-Town Beach expense, $34,842. Recreation department director salary, $65,955. Historical commission, $1,175. Veterans Day Memorial Day expense, $2,000. Maturing debt, $401,679. Interest on maturing debt, $205,704. Interest on temporary loans, $5,000. FERCOG core assessment, $41,698. Unfunded sick leave and vacation, $10,000. Franklin County Regional Retirement, $646,145. Workers' compensation, $51,370. Unemployment insurance, $20,000. Group insurance, town, $409,825. Group insurance, school, $781,385. Medicare insurance, $120,089. So we will go back to the holds. Uh, again, anyone who made a hold, if they have a comment or a question, if they can come down to the microphone. Um, and we would start with the hold on accountant's salary. Good evening. If you could just state your name and the street you live on. Sure. Mike Gilmore, Allen Drive. Thank you. Just a, a question, given the increase in the accountant's salary, is that due to looking at what it's going to cost to replace you? Or is it because there's an overlap? Because there seems to be a pretty significant salary increase there. Would someone from the select board like to address that? or? Yeah, it, 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 you're right. It is the overlap. It's not um, what, it, what, what it will go going forward. But we want to have some, we wanted to have uh, staff in there to to be with Brenda for a good amount of time to kind of transfer that over, and wanted to have the funds to cover that person, and then it'll drop back down once, unfortunately, Brenda leaves us. Once I'm gone. Once you're gone. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that that's all it is. Yep. Any other questions, Mr. Gilmore? Are you comfortable releasing your hold? Or thank you. Thank you. Uh, we had a hold on PEG access capital expense. Good evening. Evening, M.A. Swedland, uh, 22A Snowberry Circle. What is it? Fair. <laughs> Great question. Someone from the select board or? Do you want to hit it? Caroline. Okay. No, go ahead. So uh, PEG access is uh, capital is, is the funding we use for FCAP for capital equipment. So FCAP funds all of, you know, films all of our meetings and does all of our items and this is the capital that we uh, fund them each year as part of a, a contract through Comcast, I believe, right? Right. If I get that right. So the contract with Comcast, they give us the $4,000 for that specific purpose in the previous fiscal year. So then in this fiscal year, we have to allocate it. Thank you. Comfortable removing the hold? Thank you. Uh, we had a hold on police payroll. Uh, Mike Gilmore, Allen Drive. So I wasn't sure whether it was this line or the next one, but um, I've heard from other people in town that we, like other communities, are having a hard time getting officers. And as a result of that, we need to pay our officers overtime in order to cover shifts that may not be available. And in the event that we can't cover that, then my understanding is from talking to other folks that state police would end up being a backup. Um, my real question is, does the budget itself 
maintain adequate salary and overtime pay and whatever is necessary to provide in town police presence for all shifts. Select board or police chief? Police chief. Chief? Yeah. Hi, I'll try and talk. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Good. Okay. Good evening, John Pachork, the chief of police in Deerfield. I have the pleasure of serving with you guys. Now just approaching 12 years as your chief of police. This budget as presented provides two officers 24 seven to the community, 365 days a year. So when you call, as long as they're not tied up on another call, they are coming. There are two officers on. Please do not call us the next morning and tell us you heard a sound at 2.30 in the morning. Call immediately. They are there, they are on duty. There has been a few times that we've had to drop down to one person on midnights just due to staffing issues, but we do not close. We work hand in hand with the state police. They back us up, and quite frankly, on the 91 corridor, we frequently back them up. Not only do our females assist them with searches routinely, Greenfield, Montague, and state police, we work hand in hand with those folks, and we're on first name basis with every single one of them. So this is a well-presented budget. The contract for the patrolman and uh, supervisors is due up this fall. We will reevaluate our 10 town comparable. So it is a great question and we'll figure out where we come to at the negotiation table. Thank you. Mr. Gilmore. And was that your hold on the next one as well? And did that cover it? Okay. That's it for holds. Uh, so with that, Ms. Shores Ness. I move. Oh, I'm sorry. You Go ahead, I'm sorry. Okay. I move that the town appropriate $18,288,802 to fund the accepted amounts voted and to meet this appropriation, transfer $60,000 from overlay surplus, $66,500 from the Scams Enterprise Fund, 15900 from the South County Senior Center Fund, 73700 from the Sewer Enterprise Fund, $5,086 from the receipts reserved for debt, 4700 from the Wetlands Protection Fund, $10,000 from the Cemetery RRA Fund, and uh, $180,189 from free cash, and raise and appropriate $17,882,727. Second. Any questions or comments? All those in favor of the motion. Opposed? That carries. Thank you. Article 10, Mr. McDaniel. I move the town appropriate $2,164,537 for the fiscal year beginning July 1st, 2024 uh, to fund the uh, sewer wastewater treatment plant enterprise fund as set forth in the warrant. Seconded. Mr. McDaniel. So th this is the budget to run uh, both plants uh, for the year. Uh, it, it includes um, revenues from uh, user and hookup fees, retained earnings and investment income of uh, $2,164,537 and expenses will be the salaries and benefits, um, as you can see in the chart, operating expenses, uh, debt service, indirect administrative costs and operational reserve. Any comments or questions? All those in favor of the motion as presented. Opposed? That motion carries. Thank you. Article 11, Mr. Hilchey. I move that the town appropriate the sum of $1,783,497 and transfer from free cash the sum of $444,368 to fund the South County Emergency Medical Service Enterprise Fund for the fiscal year beginning July 1, 2024, and to meet the town of Deerfield's allocated share of costs as follows. 
Mr. Elchie? So um, this is a year in transition for SCIMS. We have a new chief in place. Um, we have set aside in a previous year money for a new ambulance. But in order to do that, uh, a lot of the retained earnings from previous years was utilized. Um, and uh, we are looking to increase the services that the, the SCEMs are providing for um, our three towns, as well as to help uh, surrounding towns as, as, as possible. And if you have any questions specifically, um, I believe that uh, uh, Mr. Moderator, if you could let uh, the new SCEMS chief speak for these things. Sure, absolutely. Any questions or comments? All those in favor of the motion as presented. Opposed? That motion carries. Article 12, Ms. Shores Ness. I move that the town transfer 16,000 from the SCEMS Enterprise Fund retained earnings, transfer 15,000 from the SCEMS rent stabilization account, reallocate and transfer $30,000 from the SCEMS exhaust project approved in Article 8 at annual town meeting on June 12th, 2021, and reallocate and transfer 44,000 from the SCEMS cardiac monitor project approved in Article 10 at the annual town meeting on April 24th, 2023, to fund the additional FY 2024 projects as set forth in the warrant. Second. Ms. Shorsness, what does that mean? Um, after a lovely gift from Greenfield of their used exhaust system and um, a hard work from uh, Lori McComb, uh, we were able to get a grant to cover the uh, cardiac monitor and, and return the funds um, to our retained earnings for the um, exhaust system, and we're reallocating them to fund the uh, station alert system, the paramedic intercept electric vehicle, and the paramedic um, intercept EV charger. Any comments or questions? Yes, we can just make it to the microphone. Fred Bechta from Eastern Avenue. I want to question the, the uh, use of an electric vehicle for emergency services. It doesn't seem really feasible to have something we have to worry about a short run time, uh, especially with using emergency lights, um, you know, maybe a computer on board, et cetera. It, it seems between that and the extra expense for a charger system in there, is this feasible? Is our EMS chief here? Um, I would like uh, our chief to answer that question. Yes, yes. Chief, if you can make it to the microphone, that'd be great. Chief, if you'd just like to take one second, introduce yourself as well. Hi, Joshua Sparks. I'm the chief of South County EMS. Thank you for the question. Uh, uh, I think I initially shared the reservations surrounding electric vehicles for emergency services work. Uh, uh, we have seen over uh, since 2018, the technology has changed uh, substantially. Uh, there are services all over the world uh, using electric vehicles in the capacity that we're attempting to use it in. Uh, it was interesting to note that as the police cruiser uh, increased in cost, the price on electric vehicles is decreasing, uh, narrowing that margin. Uh, so what we would have spent uh, on a very similar uh, vehicle, we can now put into the charger. We're still spending the same basic amount of money, uh, but we need it to basically run for 12 hours, uh, which it can very easily do. Does that answer the question adequately? Anything else I can answer about that? Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Any other questions or comments? All those in favor of the motion as presented? Opposed? 
That motion carries by two-thirds majority. Article 13, Mr. McDaniel. Uh, might be me. Okay, sorry. Mr. Hilchey? Yep. I move that the town transfer $101,500 from free cash, $42,600 from sewer enterprise fund retained earnings, and $35,500 from SKIMS enterprise fund retained earnings to fund the capital improvement plan for the fiscal year beginning July 1, 2024, as set forth within the warrant. Mr. Elchi? Um, where is my little... So, um, this is going to... Uh, is there a chart available with this in the, in the printout? It's on the next page? Okay. Um, so, DES... Th this is only the 105. So um, DES air conditioning phase two or six rooms. There's uh, 72,000. Is that mm -hmm. yes? yes. 72,000. That's going to um, make it easier for students to sit through uh, to to sit into their uh, their classrooms with the the heat on the getting hotter in the spring and 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 staying hotter longer in the fall. So this is a several year plan to um, ap approach several rooms a year so that uh, we can uh, improve the learning conditions for the kids. Um, there's also 17,000 for a server replacement. The, uh, the town hall computers that uh, run off this server uh, is, are critical to the operations of the town and uh, the server is reached or exceeded as a useful life. Uh, and finally, there's um, the Senior Center has uh, re received a very favorable grant to buy a, a Senior Center van to, uh, and our portion of that fund is, uh, that funding is to $12,500 with other funding coming from the other towns who cooperate in the Senior Center. Did you want to hit the other items with retained earnings and scams or? Um, Let's see. Who wrote this? <laughs> um, what's that? I, I can answer. I, yes, and if you could have the Capital Improvement Planning Committee chair speak about sure, the, the rest of absolutely. this. Absolutely. Capital Planning? Uh, yes, so, uh, so some of these projects, well, actually, I should start by saying we, we actually evaluated 26 capital requests um, and unfortunately had to whittle these down. Um, the uh, <clears throat> three that um, Mr. Hilsey just talked about would be coming out of free cash. Uh, and then we have uh, two other um, capital improvements. One is the uh, wastewater uh, treatment plant uh, truck. This would be coming out of um, the uh, retained earnings uh, for the enterprise fund. Uh, we are, are very lucky that we, we actually have folks uh, who work at the wastewater treatment facility who can plow. Uh, so they will be um, not only paying uh, for this truck out of their uh, their own uh, their own account, but we'll we'll be uh, saving the, the town on um, contracted services by not not having to uh, to have someone else plow. And then uh, we also have a replacement stretcher um, that's going to be coming out of the Scams Enterprise Fund, uh, so that is not going to hit free cash. Uh, so um, those are the the last remaining uh, projects there. Any comments or questions? Yes, you can just make it to the microphone. Hi, Lily Dwight, South Mill River Road. Um, I have a question about the server. $17,000 for a server seems very high, and I'm also wondering, given the security concerns, shouldn't we be looking at cloud services, which are SOC 2 compliant, instead of trying to do this ourselves? Mr. LG? Um, I would request that uh, uh, the Casey Warren town administrator speak to this. Warren? Or Mark Brennan, whomever prefers. Oh, Mark. Casey? Tag him it. 
All right, so very good question. During my day job, I'm actually a... Uh, Mr. Brennan, uh, we had called on Casey. We can come back to you. Oh, oh, well. oh, I, I thought you said tag him in. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mark. You can ask this better than I can. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so um, during during my day job, I, I I'm, I'm an engineer and I did you know uh, evaluate this. It's a very legitimate concern. It's one of the questions I had actually asked. Um, this server uh, has a couple problems. The first is it's outside of warranty, so a lot of the warranty you know you know the the, the contracted um, you know services for uh, you know uh, server uh, hardware is you know we're no longer eligible for uh, once we um, uh, reach the end of the warranty there. And then also. Uh, a lot of these are um, files that uh, will be stored locally, so um, the, uh, the town does have uh, contracted IT services that can make sure that um, all of our files are safe and secure and are um, being stored with um, you know, best practice, security best practices in mind. But um, what we're looking to do is um, store this locally. Uh, $17,000 may seem high, but if we were to go with some sort of uh, you know, cloud service, we would be shifting that capital cost to a, a much higher operational cost over the course of the, uh, the server's lifetime. So um, that was the, uh, the reason why we wanted to uh, support the server replacement. Any other comments or questions? Yes, if you can make it to the microphone, please. My name is Janet Ward and I live at 2B Tyler Way. And I was just asking how many of the phases of this, this is in phase two, how many more phases that have to go, um, have to be finished. And then, as if I calculated correct, we're paying $12,000 for either two to six rooms. What's the square footage that it, to me, that seems a little bit high too. So I can, I can. Mr. McDaniel? I could answer uh, some of this. Um, so this is the second phase. What, what we've been doing with the uh, DES is, the, um, is getting the AC units is the, we're, we're working with Eversource to get um, rebates back on this. So we, it's about 9,000 a room to do um, mini splits in the room, and that includes the unit putting it in. But then we do get rebates, and we're trying to uh, get several more rooms. Last time we were able to do a couple more rooms because we were getting rebates back to fund additional rooms. Uh, probably Bill Hildred or, or uh, Darius Modesto might be here that would be able to answer how many more rooms. We have a lot of rooms at, at DES. It's going to take a while to get through most of them. I, I can't remember how many we've done already. Darius, do you happen to know if you're handy? Mr. McDaniel, if we can just kind of keep everything directed to the moderator. Oh, it's your sorry. own town rules. I'm just trying to keep things yep. in order. But Mr. Modesto? Good evening, Darius Modesto, your superintendent. So we're in phase two of three phases. There's 14 more rooms to do. Thank you. This doesn't include large, larger areas. We're just look, concentrating on the classrooms. Um, and we're also working with the Energy Committee um, to work on getting a building management system to support those so that we can have the dual um, cooling and heating in the classrooms being controlled that way as well. So that's where we're at. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? All those in favor of the motion as presented. Opposed? That motion carries. Article 14? Good evening. I'm Julie Caswell. I am the vice chair of the Community Preservation uh, Committee. And I move that the town transfer $46,000 of the Community Preservation Fund 2025 estimated revenues to the uh, reserve for Historic Resources, General Law Chapter 44B requires that a minimum of 10% of estimated revenues be set aside for Historic Resources. I think we're going to do all these together. Yeah, too. we're, we're going um, to do them all together. I move that the town transfer $46,000 of the Community Preservation Fund 2025 estimated revenues to the reserve for open space. General Law Chapter 44B requires that a minimum of 10% of estimated revenues be set aside for open space. I move that the town transfer $46,000 of the Community Preservation Fund 
2025 estimated revenues to the reserve for community housing. General Law Chapter 44B requires that a minimum of 10% of estimated revenues be set aside for community housing. I move that the town appropriate $23,000 for the Community Preservation Fund 2025 estimated revenues for Community Preservation Committee administrative expenses. And finally, I move that the town transfer 299000 the balance of the Community Preservation Fund 2025 estimated revenues to the Community Preservation Budgeted Reserve. Second. Ms. Caswell, if you could just briefly describe the motion. The Community Preservation uh, Committee did not uh, forward any proposals this year, uh, or in other words, did not approve any proposals to bring to town meeting. So this is moving all of the community preservation funds into uh, budgeted reserve for the future. Thank you. Any comments or questions? All those in favor of the motion as presented? Opposed? That motion carries. Article 15, Mr. McDaniel? I move that the town accept the provisions of General Law Chapter 59, Section 57C for the purpose of establishing a quarterly tax payment system to be effective July 1st, 2025, fiscal year 2026. Second. Mr. McDaniel. So uh, quarterly bills would provide taxpayers the following. Uh, set due dates each year. Um, IG August 1st, November 1st, February 1st, and May 1st. Four smaller payments made equally throughout the year. First and second quarterly payments are preliminary and typically based on 50% of the previous fiscal year total. Third and fourth quarter payments are based on the tax rate for the fiscal year as set by the select board at the rec recommendation of the Board of Assessors. The last two payments reflect the total amount of taxes minus the preliminary amounts which is then divided equally for the two remaining quarters. Changing the quarterly billing system would provide stable cash flow for the town to meet its, final, uh, meet its monthly financial obligations, plan for larger expenditures, and cost for mailings and postage is not significant. This would be a significant change for taxpayers. So this article seeks to implement the transition in July 2025 for the fiscal year 2026. Property owners would have an entire year to prepare financially with notices and educational information provided in all mailings and displayed on the website and in all the municipal offices. Any comments or questions? All those in favor of the motion as presented. Opposed? That motion carries by majority. Article 16. Hi, I'm Satu Zoller. I'm chair of the Tilton Board of Trustees. And I move that the town vote to approve the Board of Trustees of the Tilton Library, filing a petition with the Franklin County Probate and Family Court, or in the alternative, the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court. Said petition would be seeking certain modifications of the testamentary charitable trust of Chauncey B. Tilton, and ratification of past actions of the trustees and certain actions taken by the Tilton Library, Inc. slash Tilton Fund, Inc. in conjunction with the trustees in line with the summary outlined in the letter from the trustees as on file with the town clerk. Such past actions are in connection with the operation and management of the Tilton Library. Actions taken will separate the Tilton trustees and the Tilton Fund, Inc. and in said membership. And further, that the town authorize the select board to enter into and approve any necessary filings to accomplish same. Second. Ms. Zoller? In English. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I'm not going to read everything. There's an addendum in your um, packets. But basically, uh, we're responding to correspondence from the town council back in 2017 that indicated that the entities of the Tilton Library and the Tilton Fund need to separate. So we plan to identify separate trustees for each of them with several uh, that will cross over for the oversight of related activities. Um, the, the main issue is that it's not legal for us to have more than six trustees, so we need to decrease uh, our number of trustees. 
and also that there's a conflict of interest right now. The Tilton Fund and the Board of Trustees uh, should act separately and should not be the same people. Um, trustees are technically not permitted to raise funds for the library. So to do this, we need to go to file with the court uh, to officially separate the two entities. Um, basically, the trustees operate you know, and manage the library, the expenses, hire the, the director, uh, all of those day-to-day -day operations, and the fund is basically uh, to, to fundraise for the library. So, um, yeah, that's the summary. I can answer questions if people have. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, if you can make it to a microphone. Charlene Galinsky from 342 River Road. I'm wondering, um, this sounds like it involves legal expenses, does no. it? Uh, uh, all legal expenses are paid by Tilton Fund. That was my question. Who was paying for the legal? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? All those in favor of the motion as presented? Opposed? That motion carries. Article 17, Ms. Caswell? I move that the town vote to amend the Town of Deerfield General Bylaws, Article 7, Section 10 to 22, Com Community Preservation Committee, as printed in the warrant. Second. Ms. Caswell? This amendment seeks to change the bylaw of the member that uh, determines the membership of the committee to allow a member to be on the committee who's interested in promoting affordable housing. The bylaw right now says that um, specifies that a member of the committee who is a resident of Deerfield and who is on the regional housing authority be on the CPC. We don't have a member in town who is on the uh, Regional Housing Authority, and we usually uh, don't have one. So this would allow us to instead uh, have a resident uh, appointed who is uh, a resident and who is interested in affordable housing in Deerfield. And that would also allow us to uh, reliably have a quorum for committee meetings. Any comments or questions? All those in favor? Opposed? That motion carries. Article 18, Mr. McDaniel? I move that the town change the use of the parcel of land indicated uh, on the Board of Assessors records as map 169, lot 186, former Alice property, uh, from general municipal purpose to land for dis uh, disposition and to further authorize the select board to convey, sell, or otherwise dispose of said parcel and to authorize the select board to enter into and negotiate all necessary documents subject to such restrictions and limitations as the select board deems appropriate in order to effectuate the disposition of said parcel in the best interest of the town. Mr. McDaniel? Sure, so this is, um, anyone understands, this is the property that um, was uh, storage for the highway garage. It's a old kind of a barn um, right in between the new pilot, uh, the new um, New Pro building that went in and the old Alice property. The Alice property is no longer there. It was purchased by New Pro and um, we're looking to sell that chunk of land that's landlocked in that building and um, hopefully have another, another place for, for that storage closer to the highway garage. Thank you. Any questions or comments? All those in favor of the motion is presented. Thank you. Opposed? That motion carries uh, by two-thirds majority. Article 19, Mr. Hilchey. I move that the town appropriate and transfer from general stabilization $600,000 to fund extraordinary road and sidewalk reconstruction 
and repairs and for all of the costs related and incidental thereto, including engineering and design. Second. Mr. Elchie. First, um, the language in the article was reflects the original language that was in the article requesting funding at special town meeting in October 23, 2023. Uh, the state authorized Deerfield to deficit spend to make emergency repairs on roads damaged by torrential rains in July 2023, and state law obligates the town to pay off the total amount of deficit spending by June 30, 2024, the end of the current fiscal year. The town anticipates that 600000 will cover the remainder of expenses for these repairs after deducting a $1.58 million grant from the state uh, and um, some retained money from a previous storm damage grant from the state. Any comments or questions? All those in favor of the motion? Opposed? That motion carries by two-thirds. Article 20, Ms. Shores Ness. Um, I'd just like to take a minute, um, uh, Mr. Moderator, and I'd like to thank uh, John Pachorek, our police chief, who was our acting EMD for the hundreds of hours he has put in to help restore and um, repair our roads. He has been uh, an energizer bunny, I have to say. So I'd just like to take a look. I move that the town rescind all of the borrowing authority approved for the extraordinary road and sidewalk reconstruction and repairs and for all the costs related and incidental thereto, including engineering and design approved through Article 10 of the special town meeting on October 23rd, 2023, and approved at the special election held on January 16, 2024. Second. Ms. Shores-Ness. Um, I just want to say that this is for the, when we initially had the damages, this was our initial estimate, and it had to be paid for um, by June 30th. And so we were consistent all the way through. We really didn't have a choice, even though we knew it was going to cost less. Fortunately, the state, uh, through extraordinary efforts of our legislative delegation, uh, Joe Comerford and Natalie Blay, and working with the governor every, and the Karen Spilka of the Senate president, we were able to get um, at least $1,580,000 uh, from the state before June 30th. We had um, 200, 000, more than 200000 left over from the July 21 storms from, again, extraordinary efforts of our legislative delegation that we put towards the expenses. But we have now stabilized our roads, and we anticipate um, not having to use any of the borrowing authority that you all trusted us with, and I want to thank you all very much for. Hold your breath this July. <laughs> Can I make a comment regarding that? Uh, this is, I'm Lori Conlin. I live at um, 5 Hillcrest Avenue. Hillcrest meaning like literally the crest of a hill up top and I'm not in any danger of flooding. And I've, I was like heartbroken with all the flooding that I've seen and um, friends and who have suffered from it in the roads. And I was, I'm so grateful for the advocacy that I saw happen from select persons here and Natalie Blay, Joe Comerford involved with um, Mr. McGovern, um, Senator Warren was out here, and there was such teamwork from all our representatives in getting us um, state and federal funding for those um, re repairs. So thank you so much for all your hard work. Any comments or questions on the motion as presented? All those in favor? 
Opposed? That motion carries. Article 21, we have a citizen's petition. Hi, I'm Carrie Etchells of Thayer Street. I move that the town authorize and request the select board to petition the general court of the Commonwealth for home rule legislation to allow any citizens in the town of Deerfield, notwithstanding the provisions of MGL 51 sections one and section 47A, who have reached the age of 16 or older, to register and vote in municipal elections within the town of Deerfield. Is there a second? If approved, this would allow Deerfield to join several other communities petitioning the state to allow 16 and 17 year olds to vote. It would not take effect immediately. It will go forward for approval by the state legislature. Sunderland became the most recent town to join that group after voting yes on their article on Friday. And Conway and Waitley will vote on this in the coming weeks as well. I'm the chair of the Deerfield Elementary School Committee. In April, both the Deerfield and Frontier School Committees voted in favor of a resolution to support this article. According to the Massachusetts Association of School Committees, one of our tasks is to engage in advocacy on behalf of students, and our committees voted in favor of this to show support for our students. This movement also has the support of government and social studies teachers at Frontier, among others. This petition was brought forth due to the work of a group of adults and youth in the four Frontier Regional and Union 38 towns. There are some Frontier students here tonight to read a statement, and Jessica Corwin of Sunderland is available to answer questions as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, step right up and go ahead. Hi, my name is Josie. I live in Sunderland and we're seventh graders here. I'm one of the students who worked on the citizens petition to lower the voting age to 16, along with other friends and adults. We've gathered signatures to put this issue on the town meeting warrant for Sunderland, Deerfield, Conway, and Waitley. Sunderland passed this article to lower the voting age last Friday. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Jimin. Um, we think that giving voting rights to 16 and 17 year olds would be good for everyone because it would get us in the habit of voting before we get even busier, making it more likely that we would vote consistently as adults. We would get to learn more about town politics and town meetings while we still live in our home communities where we already care about the issues around us. Letting 16 and 17 year olds vote would help increase overall participation in town elections because there would be more people and they would be younger, which can help them make better decisions in the future. Hi, my name is Araceli. I know that some people think that 16 is too young to be responsible enough to vote. I wonder if everyone believes that every 18 year old is responsible enough. What about 25 year olds? <laughs> Knowledge and experience are not requirements for voting eligibility. 16 year olds have many adult rights in Massachusetts, including working a full time job, paying taxes, getting married, driving a car, and owning or running a business. They are subjected to all these laws but have no say in making them. If this article passes our select board, we'll ask Natalie Blay and Joe Comerford to file a home rule petition with the state legislature, which must be approved before 16 and 17 year olds can actually start voting here. Other towns and cities have filed similar petitions without any response and hope that adding our four frontier regional towns to this group will force the legislature to act. In other words, the town of Deerfield could eventually be one of the reasons that teenagers in Boston, Lowell, Cambridge, Brooklyn, Southboro, and Northampton get to vote in their own municipal elections. Please vote yes on this article to build on current and future democratic engagement in Deerfield and beyond. Thank you. Did you have something to, to add? I do, yeah. You can just introduce yourself. Yes, I'm Missy Novak. I'm at uh, 87 Sugarloaf. Uh, I just wanted to lend some information uh, to this. This is an article that doesn't, doesn't have an immediate action. This is an article that asks the select board to ask the legislators, the legislators to file a home petition rule to allow 16 and 17 year olds to vote. So this isn't a vote that's going to have an impact in this coming election. If you are concerned about a 16 or 17 year old who is voting now, uh, don't worry, they'll probably be 18 by the time this happens. And once you hit 18, you don't have to pass a test in order to find out if you are knowledgeable enough to vote. In fact, uh, many of us may remember, maybe not those three, but 
the older ones may remember a, a TV show called Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? I bet you those 16 and 17 year olds will pass a government test far more, at a higher rate than, than we will. Um, we've had a lot of interest from the government and history teachers, and we are really a community that is beholden to people who volunteer many hours of their time for, as we just saw in the budget, not a lot of income. So we really appreciate all the work that you guys do for pennies. Um, so just take a moment. Thank you for all the work that you guys do. So lowering the voting age to 16, as these kids have just relayed, this gives them some stability and a stake in the community that they're involved in to start to build the habit of voting, hopefully to encourage them to follow in your shoes and become involved in the government that they decide to reside in at some point in time, whether it's Deerfield or another community. When they're 18, they're in a transitional point in their life. So they may be moving on to independence, moving to another community. At 16, they are much more likely to be here and develop consistency in their voting habits. The other thing that we see in communities that have passed this kind of legislation or these kind of articles is that not only do the 16 and 17 year olds turn out at higher rates than the adults do, but they also turn up the adult uh, voter turnout. So, you know, how many of you are here because of this? Because you're interested in either encouraging more kids to vote or maybe not. And why is that? So, I encourage you to vote yes on this. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Lori Conlon, Five Hillcrest again. Um, I just want to echo my support in favor of this resolution. I am a parent in this district and have been an educator in this district. I'm now currently in another district, but um, I do know some of these students personally, and I know that um, the work that's been done at DES has um, implemented um, or inspired this kind of civic engagement, and I'm so proud of that, and I know that comes from the awesome educators that we have at DES who um, foster critical thinking and um, value of civic engagement and working for our community, and I'm really proud of the work that these students have put into this. So I hope that everybody will consider it carefully. I also am someone who has um, canvassed tens of thousands of homes and I'm really involved in getting out the vote um, locally, statewide, um, nationally. And I can tell you that there have been times I've been on college campuses where I like literally beg people to register to vote with lollipops. Um, and then there have been doors that I've been at where I shake my head and say, do I really want this person voting? Except for my, you know, sincere, heartfelt um, wish that everybody has a say um, in our country and our, our town. So I really take this measure to heart because I think that um, while some people may fear about certain factors of 16 and 17 year olds voting, um, first remember that this is a first step. It's not voting on that per se, it's voting on a resolution. And it's a first step to have increased discussion at the local level, at the state level, and there'll be a lot more discussion for pros, cons, we can figure that all that out, and there's no reason to squash that now. Um, and just support that these students have raised these really good points and good arguments. Um, and then, truthfully, what the resolution itself, it says, there are 16 and 17 year olds um, contributing in a lot of ways to our communities, and they should know that they have a voice. And that is gonna inspire them to stay involved, um, participate, get their friends to participate, get their parents, families to participate, and if there's anything we need, it is that. So I urge you to support this, um, and we can have further discussion, but vote yes tonight, support these kids, support our, support our town, and support getting people involved in discussions in our community, um, our town, our state, and our country, because we need it. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. If we can just, just kill the applause, it's really, it's not permitted under your laws, and just, it, it, if we can just let everyone speak and we'll get through this. 
get, get as much information as we can. So go ahead, sir. Hello, my name is Mark Brennan. I live on Boynton Road. Um, I would just like to ask, what effect would this have on our community? As, as a 14-year-old myself, I own my own business. I pay taxes. I am adding to this town and the state. I would like to ask, how would this affect our turnout? Because as an adult, many of you probably have children or have had children. As an adult, you can affect how they would vote. You could say maybe like, hey, you don't vote for who X person. You're not allowed to do this. X, you're not allowed to do that. And that could affect how people turn out. It could sway the votes for people that are not. That, uh, that shouldn't have gotten those votes. And on top of that, also, these, the reason why an 18-year-old can vote is because an 18-year-old can go to war. They can go to war under law. That's why they can vote, because it, it wasn't fair for them to not be able to vote on going to war or not. And for a 16-year-old, they, can, they can't go to war. They can't sign a contract. They can't get their own credit card without their parents' permission. And I don't think it's fair for a 16-year-old to not be able to live their life and have to vote on things that they may not agree with. Thank you. Does anyone from the proponent of the motion wish to respond? Or? Ms. Galensky then? Thank you. Yes, Ms. Shalafan, go ahead. Oh, I don't want to respond. I want to make a comment. Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to call Ms. Galensky. We'll call on you next. Thank you. Go ahead. Me? Yes. Oh. Um, Charlene Galensky, 342 River Road. Um, this is a serious article. This isn't um, anything that we should take lightly. Um, this involves people's taxes. Uh, believe it or not, it is a vote, a 16 and 17 year olds vote. They could be impacting any taxpayer sitting here um, to have higher taxes. And this is not probably the best time to talk about taxes because we've heard uh, very high increases in a lot of people's taxes right now. So to add this article might also add taxes. And my concern is uh, that were these children that put together this article, did they have a conversation about the, the pros, which they obviously have, and the cons? Because was there ever a discussion about how this could impact the taxpayers in this town? Or was it an excitable moment for young children where they might be able to make a big change in the, in the town, which is very exciting for young children? I, I, I get it. I was an educator for 37 years. But it is an impactful article. And I went to a... Um, uh, a board of Selectmen's meeting when this article was presented, and I, uh, it was just uh, Carolyn and and uh, Tim there, and I asked who presented it, and I really didn't get an answer, and then I asked wh why it came about, and I didn't get an answer. Um, so the only thing I can rely on is what I heard tonight from these children, who did a very nice job. They did an excellent job, um, but I read four letters to the editor to try to find out what, what is their real intent. And I gleaned three things from it. They want definitely higher voter turnout. They feel people aren't coming out to vote. And that could be for a number of reasons. Mental health was the one that really came into, kind of jumped out at me, that they, they feel, at least two of the articles of the four, feel that mental health will decrease if they're allowed to vote at 16. Um, I didn't see any data, but I went and did some research because I wanted to see, is that absolutely true? And I actually have data that I found really disproves that. And the last thing was to show leadership and uh, uh, decision making, which is something we all do in every classroom every day. So as far as I just think it's important for people to hear this, this is from the MHA, which is a nonprofit organization which does data on mental health. 16% of kids from ages 12 to 17, or more than 4 million adolescents, have one major depressive episode in 2022. 10% of these children, 6 to 16, have clinically diagnosable mental problems. 
70% of children and adolescents have mental health problems and they do not seek uh, appropriate intervention. 50% of mental health problems are established by age 14 and 75% by age 24. These are alarming figures and I think we can all honestly say COVID has done some really negative things to our young people and they are, they are struggling with it. They have, pro you know, they are, we see it. We hear about bullying, we hear about all kinds of negative things that these poor children are having to undergo. To put another stressor into their lives from 16 to 17, to me, isn't going to help the mental health. It's going to make them more anxious. Do they vote the way their friends do? Do they do what their parents say? Can they stand on their own? There's a lot of questions. So I'm feeling as a taxpayer, but also as an educator, these children, they're on the road to adulthood, but they're not there yet. It's an honorable measure that this group was very passionate about. You could see it, you could hear it, but I'm feeling it's not the right time. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle Fong. I just wanted to offer, is it going? Hello? Hello? I can go up there. <laughs> Oh, there it goes. Okay. Um, I just wanted to offer some clarifying comments on the Finance Committee um, recommendation that was printed in the, in the document. Um, the reason it talks specifically about the costs and labor for administering elections is that generally the Finance Committee doesn't offer an opinion, a recommendation either for or against, if there's no financial impact. But this actually does have a, a decent sized financial impact on the town. Um, there are, if it passes and it then passes the legislature, um, then a separate, um, you know, honestly, probably the town clerk would do a better job of explaining this. Um, but there, there are costs in administering this process from the town clerk's office, so we would probably have to increase hours for the town clerk and you would, there would be additional costs for printing separate ballots um, because we would no longer be able to have the municipal and state and federal ballots all in one ballot. We'd have to have two. So there are some um, decent sized costs to passing this. Um, so there are many things that we decide that cost, I mean cost to everything that we do and often we decide that those costs are worth it. The reason the Finance Committee did not recommend this is that some people on the committee supported it and felt like the costs were worth it. More people on the committee did not support it and did not feel the costs were worth it. Thank you. Thanks. Mr. Hilchey? Um, yes, yeah, so I'd just like to make a small clarification um, uh, to Ms. Galinsky's comment. Uh, she asked us this question twice, and in both instances we responded that this was a citizen's petition it was brought forth by um, educators and students and that uh, they followed all the laws regarding citizens' petitions and that we allowed this to be placed on the warrant because they'd followed the laws. Um, I remind people that Prop 2 and a half began, was a citizens' petition and it's probably been a good thing for taxpayers because it's limited the amount of money that we can raise in an annual tax cycle. Mr. Pereski, did you have a comment? That's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sharp? Uh, <clears throat> less of a comment, more of a sort of question context. I just wondered if the town clerk um, could let town meeting know how many 16 and 17 year olds actually live in Deerfield? Sure. sure. Um, currently, there are 63. <laughs> Thank you. To the microphone. Hi. My name is Jennifer Remillard. I live on Conway Street. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm also the Senior Center Director. We let older adults who suffer from mental illness and anxiety and depression vote every day. So why should a child not be allowed to vote because they have mental health issues? Um, at 16 years old, I worked two jobs. I paid taxes. I didn't live here. I lived in Agawam. I worked. I worked all through high school two jobs. I continued to work until now. I am 48 years old. I also think that allowing young adults to have some agency 
and their local town government, not national politics, would help relieve any anxiety and depression they have because everything is forced upon them. They are not allowed to have an opinion to vote on anything that they enjoy. So maybe by allowing our youth to participate in government, we would not have continual vacancies on different boards in our community. We would also have more people interested in what's going on. The fact that these young children, young people have gathered together and are interested in civics is huge. There is such a lack of engagement um, nationwide in our political system and a lot of people you talk to will say, I'm not interested, I'm staying home. So I think it's encouraging to pass this. The 63 people in our community of Deerfield actually could sway an election because we're a small community and look at some of the local elections that have occurred. We've had minimal voter turnout. So maybe by having young people advocate for this, it would be really beneficial all the way around for our town, for our youth, and for our government. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Upton. Yes, good evening. Uh, Jeff Upton, Hillcrest Ave. And uh, to start off with, Article 21 is a very difficult article to address because of the nature of the being here with the youngsters. I will uh, say that the young students here tonight that address the audience did a great job. And well done. Uh, the second thing is when I speak, obviously there's a lot of grandparents here and parents here and young people. And this is not to offend anybody, but I oppose this article and there's several reasons why. To start off with uh, background very quickly, uh, construction background in education background. 30 plus years as a teacher and administrator. I dealt with youngsters from age seven up through 18. I was in a little different environment. I was a vocational educator and a vocational coordinator and I did not spend just an hour or two with kids a day. Uh, our system worked where I was with students 30 hours a week. I got to know those students. My career, my teaching career, was probably some of the best years of my life. I really enjoyed working with young people. As far as watching maturity, obviously at your different age levels, you have people, some 16 years old, very mature. Some 16 year old, very immature. We threw this 16, 17 age bracket on and comparing them to 18 year olders. If we're going to do that, I guess my response would be, well, why don't we include 13, 14, 15 year olders also? If you're going to include 16 and 17, Somebody mentioned, well, you know, they can drive at 16. Yes, they can. After they spend hours studying, pass a performance test and a written test, that's when they qualify to get their driver's license and can drive. In this situation, we are dealing with an $18 million budget. And it's not just the money, but look at the language in some of these articles, especially when you come down to legal language in some of our bylaws. Do we really believe that 16 and 17 year olds can fully comprehend that language? A lot of us here struggle with it ourselves as adults. Let's be honest with each other. And don't get me wrong, I really admire the young people. Now, if we want to make this a learning experience, I don't know if people have heard about capstone projects. Capstone projects in schools 
are projects that students take on that involve outside of the school, in the community, things that they can do within the community. Also, I spent probably, I don't know, select board and several other committees can attest to probably 15 years going to meetings, select board meetings, planning board meetings, capital improvement committee meetings and so on, school committee meetings occasionally, and guess what? I have not seen one young person there, 16 or 17 years old. If you want a learning experience, attend the meetings. And I'm talking about even adults. I started attending probably when I was late 50s on a regular basis. And boy, have I learned a lot about town politics. So if you want these students to learn and to grow, to get them to prepare to vote, I would recommend that they start attending all these meetings because, boy, you can learn a lot. So I guess my concern is, is that I don't think 16, 17 year olds are ready for this. And I know the bottom line is going to be, well, at some point, you know, this is the only resolution that. No, the bottom line is they're eventually going to be able to vote. Now, if people are that confident in this whole process and financially, can people sit here and tell me that they would allow a 16 or 17 year old son or daughter walk into a dealership, car dealership, without any authority looking over them and allow them to get into a contract if it was legal and buy a vehicle with payments involved. Please tell me what family here has allowed a 16 or 17 year old student to take over the checkbook, the family checkbook. I'm, I'm sure I'm going to get in. Don't worry. You don't have to do that. <laughs> 16 or 17 year old. What family has allowed them to take over the checkbook and run the household. I don't think so. So, and that's nothing to say. There's some. Great, I'm sorry. There's no, some, no, there's no, some great, no, there's no, some great no. Kids. Mr. Upton, if you can wrap up your comments, but they'll yeah. leave no outbursts. It won't happen. So yeah. don't even try. Mr. Upton, if you can finish up, if you have any other points. Yeah. So my point is, is that I just think it's beyond these students at this point in time, financially and with the language involved. Thank, Thank you. you. Ms. Dwight. Lily, uh, Lily Dwight, South Mill River Road. I have a question and a couple of quick points. Um, the question is, it, aren't our municipal elections already entirely separate from state and federal because they happen in May? So I don't know how that adds anything. Town extra. Council. There, there, are there, there are times that... Um, you could have a municipal election at the same time as a state or federal election. So if you had to have an override or a debt exclusion or a special election, they could be scheduled at the same time because okay. oftentimes they are for convenience. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, the other the point I want to make is that um, <clears throat> there are five cities in Maryland and two in California with more on the way who have already approved this kind of legislation. In Tacoma Park, Maryland, since 2013, they have been allowed to vote. That is a prosperous community. 16-year-olds, uh, they can be tried as an adult and go to prison. I think that we should give them the voice to speak for themselves and how they feel about their community. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Cabaco. Yes, I'm Julie Cabaco from North Hillside Road. Um, we heard that there's 63 um, 16 and 17 year olds. Um, our population is downsizing as I understand it from the last couple of years. The other thing I want to mention is I think we only have maybe 1900 registered voters. Very small 
um, amount, and I don't think it's going to make a big impact on the elections in the long run. And when we think about the actual percentage of how many of those 4,001 actually vote, that same percentage could actually go to the 63, and we might only have four people. So I Thank don't you. think it's going to throw the, the vote. Thank you. Ms. Oler. Yes, Satu Zoller, uh, South Mill River Road. My feeling on this is that you know, so many people complain about kids being disaffected and disengaged and you know, not caring and all that. And I think anything that gets our youth involved and interested and look what we've seen tonight, they're engaged students, they, they want to contribute to our town. So I'm like, why, why, what's the fear of? Like, what are we worried about? As Julie said, it's like 1% of uh, the turnout or so of our town. And I'm originally from Germany, and in Germany, people vote at 16, and it hasn't caused huge problems. Um, in fact, it's actually raised voter turnout. So, you know, so I just say, let's give it a try. It doesn't hurt, and it probably will make things better here. Thanks. Thank you. Sir. Jason Clark, North Main Street. Um, I just want to say with all due, due respect here, I was here a couple meetings ago, and I actually, after about two times to the microphone, I was cut off. And it was a call to a vote, so I'd like to make a motion to actually just call this. There's been a motion to call the vote. Thank you, sir. So Thank you. At that point, uh, that would terminate all debate, and we're just taking a motion right now on whether to call the question. So what that means is you're not voting on the underlying petition as of yet, just whether we're going to vote on it. And this requires a two-thirds majority. So all those in favor of the motion to call the question? All those opposed? That motion carries by two-thirds majority, so we'll move right to the question. All those in favor of the motion as presented? Yes, so we're, we're now voting on the underlying motion. So the motion that was made was, um, I move that the town authorize and request the select board to petition the General Court of the Commonwealth for home rule legislation to allow any citizen in the town of Deerfield notwithstanding the provisions of Mass General Laws 51, Sections 1, and Sections 47A, who have reached the age of 16 or older to register and vote in municipal elections within the town of Deerfield. So that's, that's what you're voting on. All those in favor of the motion as presented. All those opposed. Uh, I'm going to go back. I'm going to have to, to count. I'm sorry. So all those in favor of the motion, if you can just keep your hands up. You guys can wait if you want. I'll just do it section by section if you don't want to hold your arms up. So I'll tell you. I do not need any help, but thank you. I need help, but not with this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Section 1 can put their arms down. Section 2. I'm going to do the table last, if that's okay. We're all set on this section, and I didn't count the people standing in the back, so just keep yours up. Thank you. There's no one over in this section. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to recount, so if you all can put your hands up in the back again. I'm sorry, I didn't see you in the front. Or you had, I didn't direct you. I'm sorry. Front table. All those opposed. First section's all set. 
middle section. You're all set, thank you. Third section, it, third section should have it up. Anyone at the door that's voting, it's opposed? Front table. All set, thank you, give me a moment. By a margin of three votes, the motion did not pass. I move that the meeting adjourn to meet the, at the polls in the meeting room of the town offices of Conway Street in the village of South Airfield on May 6, 2024 at 10 a.m. for the purpose of elections and at the closure of the polls dissolve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Thank you, everyone. The motion is continued. The meeting is continued. Thank you. I'll second that motion.